All right. So please forgive me. I'm driving. So this is kind of on the fly. I wasn't prepared for it, but I'm going to go with it. Um, wherever you are right now, you are on Indigenous lands. Currently, I am driving on what is called the Coast Salish Territory and traveling from my home, um, which is where the Hulkabinam speaking people live. And I'm traveling down to the University of Victoria where I study and work. Um, and that is the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people um, and also the Wasanich people. Um, and so I like to just think about the fact that many of us have come to these lands by various ways, by choice. Um, you know, the land has been stewarded by since time immemorial for the folks who've been here on the land. Um, you know, perhaps we've been displaced by war or slavery or colonization or greed, you know, in hope of um, a better life. We're all here sharing these lands. And so it's just really important for us to acknowledge those who were here before us and who um, have cared for the land and um, have relations have relationships with this land. So I just want to take this time to honor those people um, and to express my deepest gratitude for um, having the opportunity to be a guest on these lands. Thank you, Chelsea. I'm sorry to have put you on the spot. Um, so this no worries, morning, that's okay. <laughs> so this morning, this afternoon, tonight, wherever you are, um, it's my absolute pleasure to have Dr. Andrew Sayer from Lancaster University in the UK here to talk to us. I've been waiting for this moment since I was an undergrad. So I am just going to mute myself and let um, Andrew um, come and teach us why class matters. Okay, thank you, Elaine. And um, thanks very much for the opportunity to do this and great to sort of meet you virtually at least after all these years of um, these emails which pop up occasionally and um, seeing your progress and all that, and um, especially on your birthday. Um, I'm going to uh, try and share the screen so you don't have to look at me all the time and um, you can see the PowerPoint. And um, from the advert, you see that I'd like to break this up into um, bite-sized chunks so we can have some questions in between each chunk. And I still like to do that, but I'm going to take them in a slightly different order from um, the advert. Um, so I'm going to start off with what class is and different levels of class and combining those two. I'm then going to go on after some questions, if there are any, onto intersectionality, a very big topic at the moment. Then on to the rich, the neglected rich, and some more questions and winding up with why class matters and more general issues that you may want to discuss. So um, here goes with trying to share my screen. Just give me some time to do this. Okay, can you see that screen? You can, I'm seeing some nods. Okay, right. Well, I don't know any of you really. I haven't met, met you, this, talked about class with you. So um, I'm kind of plunging into the unknown. So I think it's especially important that um, we talk about what uh, we might mean by class because my experience is that typically people talk at cross purposes. Um, so they're talking about different things using the same word for it. And actually, I think there are many concepts of class. They're not all trying to explain everything. They're trying to explain a select number of things and not others. And I think in many cases, these different versions of the concept of class are not actually mutually exclusive. You can combine them in various ways. But I guess, do they have anything in common? Well, yeah, they, so they form a cluster of loosely related concepts concerning, most importantly, economic inequalities, but also 
in many of these concepts connected to various other kinds of inequality that are, that are often associated with economic inequalities, perhaps to do with culture, to do with behavior, to do with identity. And so usually you need to know what, which of these things people are most interested in. What are they actually trying to explain? What do they want to use this concept for? And so as Eric Olin Wright said, the important question is, if class is the answer, what's the question? And um, whenever you see on, or if you ever see discussions on television about class or on the radio, typically they, it's a recipe for talking at cross purposes because some people think you're talking about behavior and identity and accents, ways of speaking, and others, others are thinking about economic positions and it's just a mess. So you need to um, be aware of those differences and uh, which, are, which is most useful at a particular occasion depends on what you're trying to explain. Now, some of these concepts of class merely classify social stratification is the usual name for this. So, so for example, there are different levels of income and wealth, different occupations, um, and they're just treated as different. Some are put higher than others, not always clear why, but they're just treated as differences. What they don't really focus upon is whether there are any relationships between these different strata. And I would argue, yes, there are usually different kinds. Okay, but then some other concepts are indeed relational. They're about the interdependencies between these different levels, these different positions between the various classes which are identified. And there's more than one relational concept of class and Marx is an obvious case with his basic capitalist and wage labor um, conceptualization. They are absolutely interdependent. So the wage laborers depend upon the owners of the means of production for work. The capitalists can't be capitalists and make profit unless they can find a workforce, a workforce of property-less um, people. So they're interdependent, but other class concepts can be relational as well. And Bourdieu, I assume you're familiar with, um, also stresses that his classes are relational. So the relationship between someone with high social capital and, and low social capital determines the value of any one individual's cultural capital. So what your tastes are only makes a difference in relation to other people, perhaps with different tastes. Okay, so that's, they're relational. So that's one way of doing it. But then we can also, whoops, talk about different levels and Again, these needn't be mutually exclusive. So for Marx, it's about property relations, for explaining the basic structure of capitalism. What's most fundamental to it is functioning. So if you, if you say to Marx, Marx is, um, if class is, a, is, is the answer, what's your question? And their prime question for, for Marx, Marx is, is, what's the basic social structure of capitalism? What's most fundamental to its functioning. So it's not about status, it's not about life chances, cultural differences, though of course there may be some correlation between these and Marxist classes. And it needn't exclude other finer and um, different concepts of class. Maybe they're compatible. So Eric Olin Wright, for example, um, very usefully tried to combine Marxist and Weberian concepts of class. And so within a very basic two class model of Marx, you can put, you can take account of the unequal division of labor, as I'd call it, between jobs which have more pay or less pay, between occupations which have power and which don't have power, which have authority and status and which don't have authority and status. And to some extent, they fit within the first kind, but not always neatly. They can be 
and things which and petitions which don't fit. So you, you know, a few people may have high status, but um, nevertheless be um, dependent upon others for their pay. For what, there may be wage labour. But you can then extend it beyond economic inequalities if you want. Bourdieu mentioned not only economic culture, which he didn't really explain, he admitted that he, le he leaves the economic capital to, um, to others to explain. But in addition to economic capital, there's cultural and social capital. And these are also important for distinguishing people and also for determining or for tracking differences in power. So within cultural capital, there's linguistic capital, how you speak, your command of language, how articulate you are, what your accent is. And, you know, we sometimes say in um, Britain that you can see class a mile off. You can guess from how people carry themselves, their demeanor and their, their appearance, but also you can hear them a mile off. As soon as they open their mouths, you can make a, a reasonable guess what their class position is. So there's a correlation, if you like, with economic capital perhaps, but these are also sources of power or lack of power in their own right. So some accents are stigmatized. So two people can speak the same thing, say the same words, and one person can be taken as authoritative and another as laughable according to the accent that they say, they, that they speak in. Of course, comedy makes a, a big thing of that. And these economic inequalities, sorry, cultural and social inequalities, they get embodied, as Bordier so powerfully showed, that by living within certain typical kinds of relationships, like a situation where you don't have much power or where you do have the power to tell people what to do, what they should do, then you get used to that. It become, you accommodate to it, it becomes your dominant set of dispositions. So you be, get used to taking orders on the, on the whole, and you may have questions and objections to that idea, but, or you just assume that others there will obey you and they should listen to you because you have authority. That gets into the body and to our default dispositions, our default inclinations and ways of acting. And these, this habitus, this set of disposition reflects your position in society, again, always relative to others. Okay, they aren't just different, they're connected. So whether I seem posh or middle class or whatever to others relative or to have power relative to others depends upon my position relative to them. But um, also typically we find, especially in empirical research, we have to make do with official concepts of class categorization which are very heavily data-driven and often conceptually weak, that they, they're not, the, the choice of concepts is driven mainly by what data is available rather than um, some explanatory objective or whatever. So you get all purpose class categorizations, but you can't deny that, you can't say they're, they're no use, they're often interesting and, we, we often have to rely upon them, but one needs to be critical of the very concepts that they use, the very categories, including if they're everyday categories. Which brings me on to the last one, which that we're always um, having to deal with folk or lay concepts of class. Um, we can't avoid these, we can't ignore them because they influence how people for example, value themselves and value others, and don't value them perhaps. And so it's, it's part of our object of study as social scientists, but it's also a rival explanation of the social order. Well, possibly rival, we may agree with it, but the important thing is that folk concepts um, are not seeking a rigorous explanation of something, they're just the practical use for everyday 
getting around in the world. Analytically, they are a mess. So, you know, people slide between thinking about class in terms of accent and tastes. Oh, so-and-so's posh, she likes that sort of thing, and she has a posh voice. Um, but, and then on another occasion, referring to her income or her wealth or something like that. And how these things relate isn't really considered. It's just assumed that maybe they go all together, but often, of course, they don't. So there are those different levels. And there are other ways of looking at it. There's the structural, where structures means interdependent positions, like property relations, the propertied and the property less the division of labor, the managers and the operatives or the workers, um, the skilled and the unskilled. And also other, other structures which are literally built into the environment, housing, segregation of different kinds of housing, each financed in a different way, involving different social relations of production, if you like, and housing typically different kinds of people, different kinds of household. And in different social areas, the geography of class is very much a structural thing. It's built in to the environment. So some people live in nice areas and other people in really poor environments. And then secondly, you could say you've got the institutional. And these words structural and institutional, they're used by lots of people in recent times, especially with regard to race. It's structural, it's institutional. And people tend to mean different things by those, but whatever, what I mean is that by institutional is that actual institutions like um, workplaces, organizations tend to reproduce class inequalities um, through their very norms, the practices that, that they um, support and the people who are associated with them as opposed to the people who are not associated with them, not of his application to universities, for example. So they may, they favor middle-class behaviors. And an example of this in Britain is um, Cambridge and Oxford University, which don't allow their students to do part-time jobs. Now that, may say, well, that immediately disadvantages the few working class students they have. It does, although in some many cases that's offset by giving them grants, um, which other students might not have who are better off. But it wasn't intended to be um, class limiting. It wasn't it in, intended to be discriminatory, but nevertheless it is. But as a more basic, and if you like, structural way in which institutions reproduce class, and that is simply by creating different kinds of jobs with different pay, different quality of jobs, different security. Some are nice, skilled, interesting jobs. Others are tedious, repetitive, boring jobs. And institutions, every time they hire someone, they define a position which inevitably is different from others. And that reproduces class inequalities. So universities, for example, every time they hire someone, um, they have to make a choice which helps to reproduce class, if you like. Okay, and then there's a level going beyond these distributional things of recognition. I'm referencing Nancy Fraser here, and a big step forward in realizing that inequalities aren't just a matter of distribution of resources, but recognition, who is given recognition, who's misrecognized, who's denied recognition. And this can work at a, an unconscious level. So we subconsciously or unconsciously form associations. So I, I was brought up in a white suburb west of London. And um, all the people in positions of authority were white. There was another um, suburb nearby, um, which had a large pro population of people from of, of South a Asian heritage, um, but didn't meet many of those people. They went to different school and all of those. 
So I tended to assume that if I was, had a new doctor, the doctor would be white. And, and I don't intend to be discriminatory, but it's just a, one of those unconscious associations which we make. It's a feature of our cognition, if you like. And we do this unconsciously. And so we have these implicit forms of classification, as Bourdieu says, we classify people. Oh, oh yeah, doctor, white middle-class man sort of thing, and so on. And these are very powerful in often reinforcing the differences which arise through distribution, not always reinforcing them, but, and so, Finally, there's the lived experience, and this has been the focus of a, a lot of research in social science over the last 25 years, whereas previously it was mainly about distribution and people's objective situations, rather than what it felt like, what you can do in that position, what you can't do, and how people treat you and so on, the lived experience, and there's some terrific ethnographies which basically deal with that. But Although that's become really dominant, I think, in sociology, certainly, um, there are problems with it. So, um, let me just... Oh dear, my PowerPoint hasn't worked as I wanted, but I was just going to start off with the top, the top question, which I ask you to think about. And then I was going to show the, <laughs> the answers, if you like. But if you think about how much difference would it make if the upper and middle classes were nice and respectful and considerate to the working class? Would it make a big difference if you if, if you're from a working class background, if you were treated respectfully and in a friendly, considerate manner? how much of your life would change? Well, I would suggest only a little. And it would very, be a rather co confusing situation because objectively in distributional terms, you would still be different. You'd still be in, in that job, although you may be treated with more respect in that job or you no longer, yeah, you no longer have disrespect. So recognition would be more equal, but how much would it make a difference to your objective life chances? So I would say, okay, this, all this research on recognition and the lived experience of class is tremendously important, but don't forget economic structure. And I was talking about this to my colleague, Beverly Skeggs, who some of you may have heard of, who did a fantastic um, ethnography on class called Formations of Class and Gender and becoming respectable about working class young women. And even though that's all about recognition or lack of recognition of these working class young women, she is very emphatic in saying that you, you also need economic concepts of class. You need to remember, for example, Marx's concept of class. So I would say, sticking my neck out, class and this perhaps doesn't apply to other sorts of kinds of inequality. Class is primarily the result of distribution, control over resources, what you're allowed to have and what you're allowed to do. It's not, actually, it's not only distribution, it's contribution. What, through, especially through your job, are you allowed to do? What are you required to do? How much power do you get? How much trust do you have? How much responsibility? A lot or very little. And that goes with the job and it's hard to change once you're in that job. That's, you can put that under distribution. That's what I mean by distribution. Actually it's distribution and contribution. But I would say that once those, once you get those forms of inequality, then people respond to them. They say, oh, look at her, look at him. Um, they've got good jobs. Well, they must be um, clever people. They must be worthy of respect. And look at those jobs, those are terrible jobs. They must be stupid and, and so on. So the recognition 
is a, well, it's a kind of misrecognition of what's going on, as, as if um, different kinds of jobs were created to respond to different innate abilities and intelligence, and rather um, different jobs give us different opportunities to, to develop ourselves. It's the other way around. And when you're thinking about inequalities, um, I find it useful to distinguish between kind of mechanisms which produce inequality, some of which are identity sensitive. I say, ah, woman, therefore X, Y, Z. Or, ah, black, therefore X, Y, Z. And so which, those are mechanisms which discriminate according to some features of the, the person. But there are also identity insensitive mechanisms which are indifferent to the identity of the person. And I say that class is primarily a consequence of identity sensitive mechanisms to do with markets and property relations. And an example of this is um, retail workers. And okay, we know that they've been losing their jobs in the pandemic, but even before that, of course, with the shift to online shopping, lots of retail workers have lost their jobs. So their class position has slipped down. Is that because people discriminated against them? We don't like those retail workers who we'll stop buying their stuff? No, of course not. It was an unintended consequence of people finding it easier to shop online. So that's an identity insensitive mechanism. And a lot of our behavior in markets and buying and selling things is identity insensitive. And if you're selling something, um, then on the whole, it's best you sell more if you don't discriminate according to the kind of people um, you're selling to. You don't say to certain people, oh, you can't have it because you're, you belong to that class or that ethnic group or something. Even if, even if you were a racist, for example, you'd lose out by discriminating against them. You'd lose sales. So there's some forces within capitalism which encourage um, firms to be insensitive to identity. And if you take a, a capitalist wanting to hire some labor, then um, if they start saying, well, we're not gonna have those kinds of people, we don't like them, um, then they're gonna reduce the pool of possible workers they can choose from. They may miss people who are talented and so on. Okay, they may also um, be racist and that may override that economic insensitive. Well, they've got a combination of identity sensitive and identity insensitive mechanisms. And you could argue, well, maybe retail workers become retail workers through mechanisms which involve some discrimination. Yeah. So women may be preferred to men in a lot of retail jobs. Um, so there's some identity sensitive stuff going on there. But that's different. That's a different mechanism from what, what's happening with the shift to online shopping and the consequences. Plans. So that's the first section. Um, I've been trying to say there's many concept class. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. You don't have to choose one as, as the best, the only one that you can use. It depends what you're trying to, to do. And for many things, you need more than one. But um, I just wondered if you want to um, ask any questions before I move on to intersectionality. Well, I have a question. Oh, well, I have a million questions, but I'll ask one. And I will say that I have been guilty, Andrew, of why can't people in these positions of class power just be nicer and then my life would be better? I have said that probably my 56 years. When you're talking about distribution plus contribution, I'm thinking of the work I do. Um, and women from poverty in Canada facing particularly women facing extreme barriers and trying to access higher education, then of course that would improve their lot in life and their children's lot in life. Does then that also apply to their inability to contribute to higher education? I think 
of how much literature I access that is not written from the positionality of women with lived experiences of poverty. Am I understanding distribution plus contribution correctly? I don't feel like I am. Can you say that last bit again? Okay, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure I'm understanding distribution plus contribution correctly. I'm, I'm trying to understand who's, who's what, what voices are in the textbooks, in the literature, and whose aren't, who gets to contribute to knowledge, and am I? Yeah. Answer? Maybe I'll just. Okay, yes. Um, when people say distribution, usually they think of the distribution of resources, how much money people have got, how much wealth, I mean, what resources do they command? Do they own their own house or rent it or whatever? Um, but also sometimes, and they tend to forget this, um, it can cover um, opportunities, jobs, for example, um, which have a tremendous effect upon our personalities, our characters, our lives, and so on. And um, so having a job in a university where you can be an academic and uh, write about all sorts of things, including class, um, is a kind of privileged position, I suppose. Yes, it, it is. And the people who get into that are more likely to be middle class or upper class. Uh, absolutely, certainly. Um, and that's because they've got more economic capital, which they can convert into cultural capital. They can buy books for their kids. And the parents would have bought them books, um, helped pay for them through college. Always been a, a kind of fallback an economic safety net for them and so on. And plus all the cultural capital they get um, from speaking in officially approved ways and all that kind of thing. And so, yeah, they're the ones who predominantly get to write about whatever. And um, when it comes to recruitment of um, students and academics, um, they're all sort of, the, even though academics may think, think of themselves as very aware, socially aware, um, I found that they can be extremely um, class biased. And often it's like an unconscious class bias. They say, oh, so-and-so was so confident at the interview. And uh, as an aside, I think it's one of the terrible things about confidence is that it can easily con people. And conversely, people who, <laughs> converse people who don't have confidence um, that what they say is, is not really heard because they, what pe other people notice is they, they're not confident they don't know what they're doing sort of thing so you know Trump is a classic example and Johnson in Britain very confident speak with conviction fake conviction and people are conned by confidence um, but that goes with cultural capital social capital they feel at home and um, I mean, I remember a, there's a video of Pierre Bourdieu being asked about this, and he says, well, consider a school. And um, one, of the, some, some, one of the kids is themselves the daughter or son of a, a teacher, and they know what to say, and their teacher's favoured pupil, student, and it's, it's second nature to them. So this is the habitus, basically, yeah. And conversely, for someone who's from a household which doesn't have that cultural capital, um, whose jobs don't give them the chance really to exercise power or even to exercise reason, to argue, you know, do as you're told, this is what you've got to do, get on with it. And that has long-term effects. It can be carried over intergenerationally. Just get on with it. Don't don't argue. Don't reason. Whereas for the middle classes, they're used to being heard, used to giving orders, and the upper classes even more. And so they get used to that. And um, so they fit. But um, can I ask you, Elaine, or anyone in Canada and, and elsewhere, where, wherever you're from? Equal opportunities policies, you presumably have them in universities. And am I right in saying they include um, consideration of race, gender, um, disability, sexuality, sexual orientation, and so on? 
and there's a there's something missing, which of course is class. Is that right? Yes. So um, our universities follow the Federal Employment Equity Act, which has four equity seeking groups, which are Indigenous peoples, um, visible minorities, women, and people with different abilities. And then there's an add on of sexual identity, but it's not part of the Federal Employment Equity Act. So universities, they, they exclude social class. So does the federal governments, the provincial governments, all the way, it funnels all the way down. Yeah. And I would say that there's a good reason why it excludes class. And that, because, and that is because fundamentally that's the, the one form of inequality which capitalism can't do without. I think um, you know, this can I, to the next section, but I'm, could I come in? For, uh, sorry. Yeah. Could uh, my name's Jeremy Van Buren. I'm uh, from the same country as you, Andrew, and uh, I've enjoyed uh, reading much of your material. Um, I'm a rarity in that I'm a lawyer writing about class uh, from a working class background, and Il Elaine and I together uh, are part of the association of. Uh, uh, academics from working class backgrounds, uh, which we, we've set up and for which there's a, a huge appetite. Um, I'm writing a book called uh, Class and Law. Um, and uh, one of the things I've argued for and uh, is that class discrimination be included as an additional category of prohibited treatment under the Equality Act in in the UK, it would be the Equality Act 2010, but I'm making the same argument in relation to other countries and under international law and regional law, uh, because as you rightly say, class is excluded. Um, in order to um, prohibit class discrimination, really, in a way that law can work with it within that concept and approach, one has to separate out, I think, the identity issues um, from the economic structural issues. I think there's a place for the economic structural issues in, in, in law, at least how in democratic legal systems in the creation of socioeconomic rights, rights to adequate housing, food and so forth. And I just wondered, and, and that I'm finding very challenging, but I, I think that's the correct approach. And I just value your, your thoughts on that really. Because I think you're right, there, there is this, you know, the two, the two ought not theoretically to be separated, but I think law um, in democratic states requires that. Yeah, um, empirically, there is a pretty strong, well, very strong correlation between um, the habitus of the person, their dispositions, how they present themselves, their demeanor and, and so on, and their economic class position. There can be exceptions where, for example, somebody is from a household which is um, poor economically, but uh, one of the parents, say, has a lot of cultural capital and therefore tends to spend a lot of time getting the kids to read books and things. And a few of the um, working class academics that I know have had that and special difference. So working class, yeah, but a little bit different or because the parent was a member of a trade union and a working class education association or something like that. Um, but generally um, people develop a habitus which fits with their situation in the scheme of distribution. And, and so therefore they come across in ways which reflect that, which may not be the, the job that the may, may not fit with the position that they're applying for, as in the classic case for working class person applying for a, a university lectureship or, or a, indeed a position on a course. And it would help if they were there's more sensitivity towards this, more awareness of, of this, and um, a more willingness to um, make allowances for it, if you like, which would include also 
discounting um, the, um, if you like, the favor given to the upper middle class student who's confident and articulate and already knows a bit of the curriculum or something like that, or, and is thoroughly at home doing strange things like talking in seminars. Um, so, you know, you could have an education program for equal opportunities, which would tell recruitment for people for admissions to universities and for recruiting, you know, people to jobs to try and take these things into account. But um, it wouldn't make a huge difference. I would, it would make some difference, but not all the difference, because there would be objective in it, advantages and disadvantages which they would present with and which tend to be fairly durable. Would you mind if I, I mean, I'm, I don't want to monopolize your time, but there are just four of us in this conversation. So can I come back to you on that? Because um, I'm Professor Emerita at Queen Mary's and I headed the uh, London and I headed the um, Equality and Diversity uh, Committee. And there was, as you said, a complete lack of awareness about class, but uh, and we, you know, tried to uh, bring in some considerations. But I, I think I'm convinced that unless you have law which can change and act as a catalyst to change attitudes, it's just going to continue on a sort of very ad hoc basis. So, yeah, I would I would be in favour of that. Although, I, right. I find it difficult to imagine what form the law would take, but um, right when you do well, the, the law would be similar to the prohibition on racial discrimination, which encompasses a huge number of you know ethnic minorities and so forth. And um, and sometimes I feel that when it comes to people from poorer backgrounds, things are seen as more complex. But in reality, they're no more complex than they are in defining what is a religion or freedom, what, what thought should be protected by society. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So right. if we can if we can come back to that, Geraldine, because I have was sent to sure, sorry. No, 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 please, no, don't apologize. I was sent two questions to ask. That, I'd, um, that maybe, Andrew, we can come back to at the end, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. okay, carry on then. Oh, well, no, we can wait till the end. This is... Yeah, so I'll go on to intersectionality. Okay, many sources of inequality and people are usually, or always, always I'd say, positioned within more than one axis of inequality. So not only your class, but your gender and your ethnicity and so on. Um, perhaps there's a tendency that sometimes pick up to assume that these different sources of inequality will be generally mutually reinforcing. So if you're in disadvantage in one axis, you'll be disadvantaged in another axis. Well, not necessarily. They can be mutually offsetting to some degree. So women disadvantaged relative to men, but middle-class women um, have, have an advantage over working-class women and sometimes over working class men. So it's an empirical question what the net effect of these intersections are. And let's not forget um, that it applies to the advantage as well as the disadvantage. Quite understandably, most work on inequalities focused upon the most disadvantaged. That's perfectly understandable, but particularly remembering that there are often relations between different classes. Don't forget how the advantage can take advantage, can, um, can benefit from more than one kind of inequality. Okay. And now I want to, to challenge a common assumption, which is that um, not only do these things happen to go together, they must go together always. And um, particularly talking to um, sociology students, um, these counterfactual questions produce a certain kind of resistance. I ask them, and um, there's an objection to answering them even. But anyway, if I put them, can racialized inequalities exist without class differences? 
I would say not, because once you've got people um, discriminated against or for in terms of some kind of racial racialized distinction, then that is going to mean that their economic power is also unequal and therefore you get class differences. Okay, so there, and I think there is an interdependence, but I would also argue that it doesn't work, have to work in the other direction. Um, class inequalities can exist without racialized differences. Even amongst racially homogenous populations, you can have class inequalities. And that's long, that's been the case from the birth of capitalism. It's less common now because um, the world is much more global and more um, multicultural uh, mixing, if you like. But it's important to, if you want to understand class, you want to need, you, you, you need to know what are its conditions of existence? What is necessary for class to exist? Do there have to be racialized divisions? I would say no, they don't. So lots of racially homogenous populations and regions and societies, less, much fewer now, which can exist or have existed without racialized differences. Okay, but where you have two power, major sources of inequality, generating inequality in different ways, it's very likely that they will interact and accommodate to one another. So in some ways, capitalism will take advantage of racialized differences. If it finds a stigmatized group, which is very weak in the labor market, then if, if that firm needs very cheap labor, then it would be economically profitable to, to employ them. On the other hand, you know, they probably don't have much money, so you're not going to sell much to them. Um, so it will pick out these differences, if you like. And thinking the last question, could class inequalities exist without gender inequalities? And the usual answer I get from students is no, because capitalism needs women to reproduce um, labor power at home, you know. Um, well, capitalism has, has exploited that inequality between men and women in that way for a long period, but somewhat less so now. There are lots of workers who are single, who reproduce themselves. Capitalism is perfectly happy to employ them. And they can be households in which standard gender roles are reversed. No reason why capitalism shouldn't, shouldn't employ them. So I would say capitalism doesn't need gender inequalities to exist. It finds them, given that they are so powerful in differentiating people, that's something that class, that capitalism will exploit. What can it sell to women? What can it sell to men? And distinguish between them. If it can make profit out of that, it will do so. Not because it necessarily is against women or for men, but simply because it can maybe sell more that way and be more profitable. So whenever you're theorizing something, it's always important to ask, what are the necessary conditions of existence of this object? class okay and I would say actually gender and race are not necessary conditions of the existence of class and sometimes students seem to object to that as if I was denying the importance of intersectionality no in practice they in multicultural societies gendered societies that's pretty much all societies patriarchal societies yes they will go together and reinforce one another and you may say, well, it's, surely that's a very academic question to ask about this remote possibility. Could capitalism exist without gender? Well, I'd say it's a very practical question because you then you can get a better idea of what needs to change if you want to remove capitalism, what if you want to um, undermine patriarchy. Do you have to change everything in order to change anything? That's if, it, if it, things are like that, then the picture's pretty gloomy. It's just, you know, it's too much. But fortunately, some things can be changed independently of others to some degree. Don't want to ex exaggerate. 
And then what one peculiar thing, and uh, maybe this happens in Canada, I don't know, but um, in populist, especially right-wing populist discourse, but popular and, and official, that has become common in the last 10, 20 years to talk about the white working class. Um, as a, as a, often they're being positioned as a, an unfairly disadvantaged class, um, but actually is, that's disingenuous. What's being highlighted there is, is race, ignoring the fact that um, certainly in Britain, most uh, um, black and uh, Asian minority ethnic people are working class. So working class has many colors if you like. And so one has to be critical of a kind of covert racialization of class. Yes, class is differentiated as well, you know, there's intersectionality. So there's black working class, white working class, black working class generally more disadvantaged. And, but actually many complications within that depends whether you're talking about Chinese, Chinese heritage or East Asian heritage or, or what, or, or South Asian or, or Afro-Caribbean, whatever it is, you know, this, it's always more complex, complex as, than that, as we, just, as we just heard in the last questions. But um, that's something to be aware of and to combat. Um, this masking of the fact that um, the uh, minor, minority ethnic is mainly um, working class. Okay. Do you want to, are there any questions on intersectionality? Um, I don't want to be asking all the questions, but I do. I, this is a question because it's, it's, it's plaguing me. And I've done some reading about, and I know Chelsea's done reading as well about intersectionality versus post intersectionality. And I don't understand how intersectionality is taken up in Canada when it excludes class. I don't understand how this possibly can exclude class. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But um, what's going on there? Is it, is, it, is it an attempt by middle class people who, whose identity is disadvantaged on other axes like sexuality or, or race or gender to, um, to draw attention to themselves? Or, or what? You know, there are, there, are, there are those kinds of suspicions around. You know, well, it, it's it sort of speaks to this. I call it this social characteristic siloing that is what you're talking about. Assuming that people all look the same from each category that you put them in, but it seems bizarre to to cite Kimberly Crenshaw. And then exclude class. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. And if that's what you mean by, did you, what do you mean by post intersectionality? Well, I just Meaning read it. I stumbled upon an article, and and my colleague Chelsea knows way more about it. Who I'm putting on the spot. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Chelsea. But the article was saying, is this just an academic exercise? Is it is intersectionality the way? Crenshaw talked about it, is it actually an impossibility in actuality and in practice? That was sort of generally what it was talking about, but I'm no expert. Well, it, it intersects with something else which is going on probably in Canada as well, as it is in the US and Britain, which is culture wars. And so there's an attempt on the right to set up an opposition between the working class, which usually means the white working class, and all these other groups which are um, treated as if they were mainly working class, which they aren't, sorry, mainly middle class, liberal elite concerns about their own identity, you know, identity politics and all that sort of thing. And there can be tensions there, genuine tensions there. Um, so you, know, you might say, well, class is an unfashionable form of inequality, but it's, you know, 
as important, if not more important than, than ever before, which is, does not mean that other, other kinds of uh, inequality aren't also important as well. You know, they can make the difference between somebody's life being blighted and or being happy and good and so on. Well, I'll make sure I post on the page on Shoestring's website with your presentation about the work, uh, the work from Matt Ray in the States. He's the one who told me about you. And his work is all about, um, one of his books is um, White Trash, The Boundaries of Whiteness. And it's about white trash. And, and I don't say that, those, that word term lightly. And so he does some really, really important work on this assumptions about things that you're talking about that you know all white people are evil and in my research as women are demonstrating how we can come together across race motherhood all of these things and not erase intersectionality but that we cannot be at war with one another the whole point is to come together as women from poverty I, mean, I think there's a difference relating to how people cope with difference, how they experience it. Um, does living in a city which has become very much more multicultural actually make people feel that their experience is enriched? Or does it mean that they lose their sense of belonging? They don't feel so at home. And particularly if you're economically insecure, um, then you know you may feel that quite strongly that you left that left that sense of belonging. So that, you know the emotions associated with um, old identities are powerful. They live on in the cultural memory of a society, don't they? And um, they can be counterposed to the new young groups who are more accepting of difference and so on. Uh, often living in big metropolitan areas, you know, and for whom um, an explosion of diversity, if you like, um, is exciting or enriching. And um, they've still got they've got jobs, perhaps, and so it's not threatening. Perhaps. But there's a lot, those kinds of issues wrapped up in it, in the culture wars thing as well, you know. And, um, you know, I think some, I was looking back at some of our emails, Elaine, and I recommended um, Ali Hoschild's book. Um, what is it called? Um, strain, the book about the strangers. Her research on the American Tea Party, uh, where she did an ethnography on white um, members working in middle class members of the, the Tea Party and sort of lived with them and you know and uh, found that in many ways they're kind of warm generous people um, but trying to understand how they feel and how they feel treated what's their deep story as she puts it I think that's worth doing to understand the uh, kind of politics of intersectionality in class. So. Okay, any more? Shall I go on? Or? Okay. So sneaky um, plug from my book, Why, Can't, Why We Can't Afford the Rich. The Rich. When I, when I did the book, I, I found a website where you can make badges like this, or but, do you call them buttons? Um, so I had a load down and gave them to friends, but um, Sorry, they're small in number, and therefore lots of social scientific attempts to talk about class and to categorize, to quantify it, just ignore them. Small in number, but huge in economic and political power. And okay, there's some very famous members of the rich. There's the Jeff Bezos and the Zuckerbergs and the Gates and so on, and um, superstars in football and so on and in, in uh, sports um okay they're well known but most of the the super rich are unknown to the general public and they prefer it that way and very often they and the politicians which support them 
um, are happy to be ignored and they like to call themselves middle class. So Boris Johnson, David Cameron, the previous um, prime minister will call, call themselves middle class, anything but. They are certainly not in any sense in the middle. And we must keep this category of the upper class, I would say. I mean, the term middle class didn't make any different, any sense unless there is an upper class anyway. And um, what to become upper class in that sense of super rich, say the top 1% or 0.5%, 0.1%, um, you need unearned income. Well, one simple form of that is inheritance. It's still tremendously important and becoming more important, in fact. And if you go to any um, video on YouTube, say how to get rich quick, or read a book on that from say airport lounge stuff, um, what they tell you is you need passive income. And that is a euphemism for unearned income, which you get not by producing new goods and services, but by controlling something that other people need or find useful and find indispensable. So land is the obvious example, but property, so you can get rent. And uh, in the case of buildings, once you've built them and paid for the construction costs and maintenance costs, anything over and above that is something for nothing. It's pure economic rent. And so that is not based upon providing a new good or service, is by monopolizing can access to something which other people need. And it supplies to capitalists as well, monopolizing the ownership of the means of production. And things like things which give you a monopoly of, of something really important, like an internet platform or intellectual property. And that sounds obscure, you know, to do with economics, but it's tremendously important for um, allowing people to get huge amounts of unearned income. And so if you get a million pounds without producing anything, that million pounds has only got any value if there's goods and services it can buy. Well, somebody somewhere else must be producing those goods and services that you're buying, but um, you're not paying anything for them in terms of goods and services. You just got money extracted. So it's something for nothing, it's parasitic. So they're not only capitalists in the classic sense, but rentiers or rentiers, which includes not only landlords, but money lenders, speculators, monopolistic owners, platform owners, and so on. And we, we need to make them a lot more visible in social science and in, in politics generally, and, I, and call them out that their source of income is, is not only dysfunctional in, in the sense that you're paying something for nothing when you're paying that interest on a payday loan or something, but, or that, um, that, uh, that rent, um, but it's, it's money for nothing, it's something for nothing, therefore it's unfair. It's not a, not a fair exchange in any sense. Okay, and Canada is very like Britain and the US over the last hundred years. Um, first part of the 20th century, the top 1% taking over 14% for a lot of the time of total national income. But then in the war and in the post-war boom and workers' power, labor organization and all that, it fell to below 7%, well, about 7% in the 1970s. But from the 1980s onwards, you've got neoliberalism, the rise of neoliberalism, and this has produced a rebound. And 2007 was the top um, highest point post-war, that was just before the financial crash. Their wealth took a dip, but it's bounced up to above 14% again. So they've done well out of the crash uh, after the last 40 years, whereas for most people, their incomes have stagnated. And that's true of Canada. An increasing share of wealth created has gone to the, the rich by controlling these assets. And um, so a bit of light relief. Perhaps you've seen that one before, I don't know, but anyway. Okay, so um, any questions?
Well, I'll jump in and ask the two questions that were sent to me. Uh, one is from a student, one isn't a student, well, a student of life. They're sort of interrelated and it comes back to the identity insensitive mechanism. So um, like so many other countries, it's a massing, massive housing crisis in Canada and where we live in Victoria, it's, um, it's a warmer climate. And so people are, have made tent cities, they're called, in parks and areas. And the hatred coming down on these folks and the hatred coming down on some of the city councillors is absolutely shocking. Then the other question that came to me is my friend Jess, who is doing her master's research on homeless deterrence technology or called violent architecture or hostile architecture. You have it in Britain. It's the part, the benches you can't lay on, the spikes in doorways. This stuff is built often on the commons, paid for by taxpayers. So people can't stop and rest. They can't lay down, they can't be comfortable. And so, and she is, class is critical in her work as well. How can we explain, understand these things in terms of identity insensitive mechanisms where the last of the commons is being stripped through this horrible architecture that's by many names. And then how does a place like the city of Victoria handle tent cities where people have nowhere to go? And, and the middle class is being pushed down and people from poverty, like, I mean, the, the echoes pre-COVID were bad, but the echoes of COVID are horrific. So maybe you could help us um, help my friend Sarah to understand the tent city stuff and for people without houses. And then my friend Jess to understand this violent architecture stuff. Yeah, there's a combination of, of the identity sensitive um, processes and the insensitive ones. So for example, in, in different ways, um, for example, um, yes, of course, um, that stigmatization and that hostility towards the tent dwellers is um, absolutely identity sensitive. But the process which led them to be in that situation was probably in many cases to do with these identity insensitive mechanisms, like um, how much, what's the value of land? How much is it going up? What are people's incomes? How much can they um, do lenders? Do banks think they can lend to people safely? And um, there, the only thing about <laughs> that matters about your identity really is how much cash you've got, what's your credit rating, um, what's your wealth. Um, so whether you get a mortgage or not will depend on things like your income multiplied by a factor. Um, the job in terms of how secure it is and so on. Um, whether what your sexuality is or what um, your ethnicity probably won't make a difference to that and unless it affects these economic variables of price. I mean, it can do. So if, if people don't want to live next to people of a different ethnicity, then that will have an effect upon house prices and the economics of the market. But um, yeah, land values and all that, which so much of our modern economies depend upon, just depend upon them going up and up and up. Um, because people are banking on that, literally. Um, they produce this differentiating between those people who can afford to borrow a lot and those people who can't, those people who have to rent, and those people who can't afford to rent, you know, so um, they will interact. Um, and the violent architecture, um, again, it's a mixture because people um, don't like the idea of people sleeping rough in a certain area. They think it lowers the, um, the tone of the area and 
maybe there's a fear that will lower property values. That's the property values. If they start falling, then people can't get credit for living in that area like they used to. So there's both of these things interacting, okay? But this, this violent architecture, I even see it on university landscapes and our universities are taxpayer funded. Yeah. And then city councillors are using tax dollars to fund these things, which is, I, I my head hurts when I, when I think about this. Yeah. And especially where universities are increasingly having to compete for resources and they, spend an awful lot of money on creating a, a reputation and an image. And when they got uh, people coming to open days to, to see if they want to study at this university, they want a nice picture, don't they? And they don't want to witness any squalor or anything that might make them feel unsafe. And the more that uh, universities compete financially the stronger those kinds of tendencies to, to avoid that. So one final question that was sent in and it's a question I would like to know as well. And then I want to pass it over to Geraldine is when we're talking about class and capitalism, Canada was colonized based on sexism, ableism, racism, and classism. And I would like to know your thoughts on understanding cl class and classism that predates capitalism. So I'm thinking about Christianity because we're, we are a colony of the British Empire. So I'm thinking about before capitalism, wasn't there social class and classism? You know, the, the nobles versus... Yeah, I mean, early capitalism, time of British and Spanish and Dutch empires and all those, um, it's, in many cases, it's different and as, as has increasingly been recognized, actually capitalism can work in two modes. One is with wage labor and the other, other is with slave labor. So, and uh, capital accumulation can, and was pretty successful for a long time using s slave labor. It, it only makes minor differences to, only made minor difference to pr profitability. And I think there's more acceptance of that now. So uh, the decolonizing the curriculum um, campaign has made people in, well, Marxists rethink very fundamental things about capitalism. Well, capitalism, yeah, it does need wage labor, um, um, but it could also, and has also worked with slave labor. And the two in articulated together with, um, you know, making that making it, difference. As regards to white settler societies, um, it's interesting on the, I don't know much about this, but you know, reading a book about um, the Scottish diaspora, and on the one hand that included um, people, especially men from the upper classes, especially men who were the younger brother, who was disinherited, and whose opportunity was, whose only opportunity was to leave and to go to where there were opportunities. And that might involve a, um, a high up position, supervisor or a position on a plantation or something like that, or a mine. And, but on the other hand, there were those people, very poor people, peasants in Scotland who were cleared off the land to make way for sheep farming. And so they also emigrated, but they became much poorer workers and white settlers. And so they have a specific class origin, but they also tend to slot into different class positions in, in wherever they settle. And of course, um, there are all sorts of colonial myths about the empty land and all that sort of thing. And um, in indigenous peoples being written out basically and clearly Canada and other the other parts of the new world is so-called uh, that's that's really important 
so yeah there were classes before capitalism classes in the very early stages of capitalism and it's largely about um colonial plunder and mer mer merchant capitalism if you like rather than big big time industrial capitalism sort of sort of um 17th 18th century very early nascent forms of capitalism and yeah they were articulated with subsequent forms of capitalism before yeah although the the wage labor kind of capitalism became dominant you know so yeah you can generalize it you can broaden it out especially take into account the history okay well thank you for um bringing up decolonization because i'm at a loss to understand how do you decolonize when this horror has happened and, and it it reverberates across generations and the the horrific impacts it has on indigenous folks and creating have and have nots and so that's yeah. a big discussion but i want to leave time for geraldine no i'm f i'm fine uh Andrew very uh, eloquently uh, answered my question, so thank you. So then maybe, um, Andrew, I'll ask you, and I lamented to Geraldine relentlessly about how do you get class onto the table in a country like Canada that refuses to acknowledge it, except for our, our new middle, no, how does it go, Geraldine, our middle cl class minister, no, our minister of middle class prosperity, it's a new position. <laughs> But it's how does somebody like me, just a, just a student, who's not in a, not ever going to escape her her origins? How do you even have the conversation to get people to go? This this matters and this is important. And Canadian universities are up the creek because they've lost their primary revenue source. Well, two of them. So it's just a perplexing, how do we have the conversation and get people to understand that class matters. It always mattered. Now it really matters for larger masses, I suppose. Okay. Well, I don't know anything about the Canadian situation. So, okay, taking, allowing for that. First of all, there's generally very commonly kind of ambivalence about class. People don't want to acknowledge it because at a deep level, I think they know it's, it's fundamentally unfair that by the accident of birth, your whole life is significantly shaped for better or worse. And um, so on one hand, they don't like to admit that say, if, they were, if they're middle class, they are middle class and they've been, they have the luck, lucky position within the lottery of birth and so on. And they want to, say that their advantage were earned. I've worked hard for it, you know. And um, on the other hand, working class people may not want to go on about being working class or certainly not wanting to say, to acknowledge being poor because of the ambiguity of the word poor. You know, if you, if a student gets her work handed back and say, this is a poor piece of work, you know, it, it's, it's not good, it's bad. It can, and it reflects badly on, on the student, you know. So yeah, poor is a loaded term. And people don't like to admit it, they're proud and so on, all the rest of it, all perfectly understandable. But I think um, we have to carry on talking about class and say that it's undeserved. It's a, fundamentally, it's a structure that we're born into, which has profound effects on our subsequent lives. And it's also important to remember, to, well, to avoid the danger, which I think has happened on the left in Britain, where class has become a, an old labor word, which is seen as passe. It's, that's, that's politics 50 years ago. They're living in the past. We've got past that now. And so we won't mention the working class, but then again, the populist right can start talking about the working class and then accuse labor of being the class of the liberal elite so that they go over the liberal you know whether this labor has become a different party in terms of who makes it up it's much more people with degrees now sure 
but um, that way, this I'm and I'm sure the same maneuver happens in North America. You know, the, the, the left doesn't knows that it can be positioned as um, last century, um, but then the the right can out can sidestep them, and so you've got to talk about class, and you've got to talk about its un fundamental unfairness. Don't let them get away with talking about um, social mobility and meritocracy and all that. I think you sh we, should, we shouldn't use those terms. We should attack them. You're gonna have upward social mobility, which is what people assume you mean by social mobility. There has to be downward mobility, unless you're expanding the number, the room at the top for people to move up into. So people swapping places that still leave society just as unequal, but um, you know, remember socialist policies are actually needed. Not the old socialist policies, they need to, they have to be green policies as well these days, otherwise we, we don't stand a chance, basically. We're in for a terrible time. But um, labor does need to be more organized. So it's an unjust, you've got to stress that it's an unjust inequality and, and that capitalism is always going to be re resistant to it because to give workers power in any real sense involves them being able to manage and control or have a big say in the control of their employer. The, you know, the organizations they work for. So um, it just has to keep talking about class and they'll be accused of the politics of envy. It's important to say that you don't envy the rich. I think it's stupid to envy the rich. Why envy people who's, who are in a position through a mixture of luck and unfairness? In an unfair game, you don't want to be playing that game. Envy is a bit, envy is a big mistake. So, so we need to say these things, but also say that we're not going to have a, a green revolution, a green new deal, unless it involves the working class and the, well, the majority of the population, the lower and middle income groups. It just won't won't get the necessary support. So it has to appeal to them, the two have to go together. But anyway, I've put some other issues you may want to come back to um, or anyone, any, any remaining questions. That's, yeah. all, that, that's my, I'm finished basically, <laughs> apart from questions. Could I raise a few questions? Um, Andrea, it's such an honor to meet you. Um, I've been reading your work for a while and it's um, it's pushed my thinking in important ways. So I was middle of the night insomnia. I saw the announcement for this website. So uh, thank God for insomnia right now. Um, I'm doing work with first generation college students in the US uh, and the supports for first gen students are all around um, motivation, um, resilience, grit. And I'm trying to frame uh, the work I'm doing with the students around they're making a run at contested social mobility. Um, but the, the language of class is almost completely absent from any talk about the euphemism we get to first generation. Um, we call it first generation, we don't call it poverty and working class students um, making a run at mobility. Um, so I, they, to the extent that there will be room for some social mobility and economic mobility in the US, how is it that we can be thinking about supporting these first generation students um, who, who have no language to talk about social class, who understand themselves to be smart and brilliant and it's a merit, meritocratic system. So therefore things should be working out and they don't. And when I work with students, we have Kleenex and chocolate out because they begin weeping when we start talking about these things, but they do not talk about their experiences outside of the groups that we form um, to do this work. Um, they've never talked about being from poor backgrounds. They've never talked about their working class backgrounds. They hide those things. And that's where your work about the silencing and the shame of class um, has helped me think about what those experiences are about. So, so that's both a, a thinking about what we do here in the States to, to deny class in education. And then also to ask, how is it that we can provide support to these students who, who have been convinced it's meritocratic and it's not? Um, 
but nobody will talk about class as we think about how to how to usher those students through college. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that um, phenomenon of students feeling uncomfortable talking about class. I mean, I've seen it so many times where I, I've said to students, usually first years, you know, what is class? And usually there's a, a silence and then some usually very upper middle class student will say, well, I don't think, I think what matters is not what class you are, but what kind of person you are. Mm. So, you know, as, as if they're in their advantage position through being a good person, you know, rather than um, to do with social class. And then silence from the working class students, you know, and that you can see they're not happy. Um, yeah, you get this emphasis on motivation and resilience and grit. I recently did an article on character and the way in which that's been weaponized by the right to um, kind of uh, say, well, you need character education, basically. What these people need is to learn, learn of grit and resilience. Well, actually, I think working class people, unsurprisingly, are much more resilient and gritty than people have had an easy life. Yeah. Didn't make any sense. But, you know, it's an old question. Can you get greater equality just through education? Well, in general, I'd say no, um, certainly not just through university education. I think if I was a, an education minister, I wouldn't necessarily give more money to universities. I'd give more money to nurseries, mm. kindergartens, first of all, um, the early years, you know, so from, you know, one upwards sort of thing, because there's a lot of research which shows these inequalities open up in the, in the early years before school even starts. And countries which have good provision, countries which have generous child benefit, um, which is really important, we need much more generous systems of child benefit, um, do better. Um, but that in itself involves reducing economic inequalities. So, you know, if you give make sure that all households can support their children. Um, that makes it, that reduces economic inequality. Um, so yeah, basically, um, you have to reduce inequality generally, economic inequality especially, and, but, but also treat education as a whole, starting at birth rather than at 18 or whenever. Jane, it's interesting. Sorry, sorry. I just want to say, Jane, we should connect because our, we're doing same research in different countries. Yeah, and I'm in Seattle, so I can take the uh, the boat up. And see you <laughs> someday. All right, you're in the states, Jane. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about? Ask about. I think it was interesting what you were saying, Jane, because. Uh, my experience in the UK is exactly the same when speaking we, we have these sort of I belong clubs and um, also testimony given by members of the Association of Working Class Academics are very emotional because it's the first time they've been able to speak about it. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not being emotional, I've just got a frog in my throat. Um, but I, I wonder if to get to answer your question, Elaine, about you know getting people to talk about class, um, we also have to discuss <coughs> the, that class will apply to certain discriminations, perhaps in relation to the upper class. People who have worked incredibly hard, they may have advantage, I'm not disputing that, or they may not, uh, being called TOFs and identities such as that. And, I realize that's much more controversial, but I think the only way we're going to get class in sort of as a prohibited form of discrimination is if we prohibit all forms of discrimination in relation to class and not just working class. Now I'm aware that such things can be manipulated, but I, I just can't see another way through it. If you object to class discrimination on the basis that it attacks both 
principles of equality and dignity, and particularly dignity, um, then you have to prohibit all forms of class discrimination, don't you? Well, I'm, I'm, just the other day I called Boris Johnson an irresponsible toff. Unfortunately, you couldn't <laughs> hear him shouting at the television. Um, but um, I'm not so sure I'd want to ban or you know, that kind of language used against the upper class, quite frankly. But, but what would be the difference between, you know, me being called a chav or an Essex girl, which, which I, you know, I, I was, uh, they're Australians, they're brogan and so forth. What's the difference between that in, then and uh, someone calling somebody a toff? I mean, why is one acceptable and one not? Toff is T-O-double-F, sorry, not a top. Well, if it was a level playing field, it, it would be equally unfair, but it's not. And so using that term uh, of abuse for someone who's um, immensely, immensely privileged um, doesn't have the same effect. They're so powerful, it, it doesn't really make, make, make much effect at all. Um, oh, well, I know people who should, shouldn't just do that. You should point out, yes, they had this parental income, they have got this wealth, these connections, this school, this university, and so on. That's the more important thing to point out. But that's what the word TOF summarizes, basically. And sometimes it really applies. Um, so because they're so unequal, you know, structurally, I don't think they can be treated as quite as equivalent. If I was talking to students, I'd say absolutely no. I would agree with you. Don't call anyone. I, you know, I want all the students to feel comfortable about talking about as comfortable as possible to talking about this difficult subject. I don't want them to feel personally uh, under attack. You know, the most basic sociological fact is the, the lottery of birth. We don't choose our parents. We're born into different places within a highly unequal structure, and that has lasting effects. So you should neither um, claim credit for your background, nor um, accept some, some kind of stigma for your background. You should always contest, refuse either. So in, in a classroom situation, I absolutely agree with you. But in the knockabout of everyday politics, then um, I'm not worried about calling Boris Johnson an irresponsible toff. I do respect about the, the classroom and I know we've gone over time here so I want to be respectful of everyone's time but some of the, the conversations in especially sociology classrooms that I have been witness to and been impacted by from upper classes have been absolutely devastating and mm -hmm. this is assumption that you just get to beat up people from poverty or working class or the underclass or whatever language that's being used. And I'm constantly concerned about sociology profs who are so profoundly uncomfortable with this topic. Yeah. I mean, there's one, one quick thing to add there. I mean, um, Geraldine used this word chav. Well, that that's a stigma word basically for the sort of um, working class, very poor. And um, I think most of the students I, which I've, who I've ever taught have been, wanted to be egalitarian and don't want to be judgmental. Um, but chav for a while became such a common term, part of their everyday language, that middle-class students and, and even some working-class students would use the term chav or chavvy. That's a bit chavvy. And so I, I, learned, I learned from this that before they even start talking about class, I told them that this word is a stigma word, you know, and it's highly unfair because blah, blah, blah. So um, I didn't want to have to tell them off because they were, you know, that their intentions weren't bad, I don't think. It's just an oversight. They thought that this was a, just a cool word, you know. 
but yeah, there's those t tricky things to negotiate, deal with. Well, and that brings us sort of round to, if we could sort of round the conversation around linguistics, how important that is, because I've heard, oh my gosh, she's dressed so trashy, seems to be gendered. And if we could talk about what those linguistics mean and the importance of them. And so, yeah, I, I don't, the idea of silence in conversations, but I'm feeling a little more confident to say to politicians and, and academic leaders, I simply explain this, we have welfare queens and no welfare kings. Do you want to understand the gender nature of poverty in Canada? It's that simple. And so it's, um, this has been really, really powerful and so educational and, oh my gosh, does anybody want to give final comments? I don't like to be the person that gives final comments. Got another cartoon for us, Andrew, or funny story? No. Do I have to look at the graph or tough or I'm not sure what that word was. <laughs> it just seems to have something to do with uh, his hair. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I know it isn't, but his hair, that's all I can think. <laughs> it is. Well, Andrew, I, I just want to thank you so much. This has just been so educational and somebody wrote how appreciative they were, how accessible this is and how educational and you taught us and you taught us from a, a place that's really honors who knows where we're at and trying to have these conversations. Well, thank you, Elaine. I've enjoyed it. Even though I'm retired, I've enjoyed it. And, uh, <laughs> I, I hope to have more conversations or exchanges, correspondence uh, with you all. So absolutely. We will. And, yes. And I'll get this recorded and sent and it's going to. Yeah.